Memories, episode 7. Welcome back to this trip down memory lane based on old mixtapes of mine. I'll be looking at uh, selected tracks from those mixtapes and um, <clears throat> start talking about uh, whatever, whatever topic comes to mind based on those old mixtapes from uh, my childhood and teenage years basically. And with this episode, I will be going way back to the start once more, more or less, um, talking about uh, my beginnings or my beginning infatuation for popular music and how that came about. I know I've talked a little bit about that already in at least the first episode and maybe... Um, uh, at some other points as well, but uh, I think there's a little bit more in that, and also the tape that I brought for this episode uh, absolutely goes back, or um, you know, sends me back to those early years when I was um, four, five, six years old, and I was bitten. By the pop bug. Pop music was uh, pretty much around me um, as far back as I can remember, so it's not that I uh, grew up uh, a shut off or, or sheltered kid. Um, I always enjoyed listening to the radio. Um, I was uh, quite often I I was uh, ill as a child you know, with the flu or with bad colds. Um, so at least once or twice a year i remember i really uh was ill and had to stay in bed for at least a good week um and of course i uh, listened to a lot of music um and what was around me my parents uh liked music the whole household or actually the whole family was was rather musical um also, people uh, could play instruments, <clears throat> um, and my parents uh, loved music. Um, they listened to uh, a lot of jazz, classical music, and progressive rock, uh, but we also heard uh, folk music, singer-songwriter, uh, 1970s, and also, of course, a bit of classic rock. But for me, things really got kicking and exciting when one day uh, my uncle showed up and brought uh, brought a few records and old tapes that for some reason uh, he wanted to get rid of. Um, to this day I don't know really why. Um, my theory is that he had all those uh, tracks somewhere else or maybe he had double copies of those tapes. I don't know. He had been um, a music fan, also from his from his uh, teens. Uh, he liked quite different music from from my parents. He was uh, when he was younger. He he had been a fan of R and B, blues, soul music, but later on also. Uh, more lightweight pop music, a little bit of disco. Um, also, his wife, I think, <laughs> had an influence there. Um, and he had a huge record collection in his home, which I sometimes marveled at, but never found the time to really listen to all of this. And those tapes that he brought were, you know, a, a small glimpse into this. Uh, all mixtapes. These are the original tapes I am talking about. They, uh, they are in in very bad shape. Uh, some of them can still be played to some extent, but they're basically in rather bad shape, but uh, I still have got them. And for a while I wouldn't be listening to anything else but those tapes. They were like uh, magical radio shows without the talking in between. None of these tapes uh, gives any artist names, unfortunately. Um, you get the, the song titles, but it never says uh, what... Uh, it never gives you the name of the artists or the bands. 
And some of those tracks to this day are a little bit mysterious to me because I don't know who the artist is. If I probably would take my time and uh, do some some research via uh, streaming servers or YouTube, I would probably finally be able to connect all the dots. Um, but sometimes I'm a bit of a lazy bugger, I guess. Um, and those tapes were uh, quite mixed affairs. Some, they all, I think, are from Pilation Records uh, he put on tape uh, that were must have been released around the late 70s, early 80s because uh, there's a lot of um, pop rock, a little bit of heavier but commercial rock from the late 70s, early 80s and also a lot of disco pop uh, that came around um, those days. But there was also one tape uh, called The Beat Goes On, which uh, focused more on uh, classic rock and pop hits from the 1960s. So that was also uh, one of the first times, apart from certain radio shows and and some, some hits I ne already knew, uh, when I uh, dived deeper into the music of the 1960s. Uh, this one, for instance, included tracks by the Beach Boys, but also Jimi Hendrix, uh, The Crazy World of Arthur Brown with Fire, uh, one of the most scariest things I had ever heard as, as a young kid. Uh, but already back then, I loved it for the sheer power that it had, this track. But I was also a little bit scared, um, and uh, some of some of these tracks, a, a lot of them are not really good music, to be honest. Some of it is really trashy, nineteen uh, seventies bubblegum pop, disco pop, as I've mentioned. But to this day, some of these tracks remain uh, cherished by me, and they are or they. Um, represent my first uh, really favorite pop hits. That's why I uh, probably held on to those tapes. Uh, at one point, they even uh, found their way into a dustbin. I think my parents wanted to get rid of them or thought they were uh, the tapes were uh, broken anyways. Threw them away. And uh, I really... Uh, climbed into the dustbin <laughs> to uh, get them out again. So that's how far my obsession with uh, for certain music tracks went already back then when I was maybe seven or eight years old. Did you ever find yourself in a dustbin? I don't know. Uh, it certainly wasn't um, a very pleasant experience, but I also remember when I was quite smaller that uh, my, my older sister and me uh, climbed into a glass container, uh, one of those containers where you uh, drop your old uh, glass bottles in. Actually, um, um, <coughs> a bit dangerous, uh, uh, but we didn't think anything of it. For us, it was just a, a fun hiding place uh, between all those those bottles in, in the container, and thankfully nobody while we were inside, the, nobody came along to uh, put any old glass into it. So we weren't injured. Everything went fine. Uh, and only later, when I thought back uh, about it, I realized that that was actually uh, a bit of a dangerous uh, little game <laughs> we played there. But uh, enough about trash, dustbins and containers. Uh, let's get back to the music. The actual tape that triggered off this whole uh, idea for episode number seven is this one. This is still working. With uh, the very beautiful title, Oldie plus Oldie equals Let's Fats. Uh, that's all I will say about my mathematic skills. A very stupid title again for my mixtapes. Um, but this tape um, is sort of a, a little a summary or a best of 
of those tapes. So I made a copy. I copied uh, tracks that were on those tapes when I realized, okay, these these tapes are really getting worn, and one day will not be able to. Uh, I won't be able to play them anymore. So before that happens, I copied some some of my favorite tracks onto another tape, which is this one. I think there are several of those tapes, but this is one of them that contain uh, a lot of the tracks from my uncle's magical pop and rock mixtapes. I listened to this stuff uh, first on on the stereo of my parents, and uh, uh, at one point they uh, they really got sick of it uh, because they. As I've mentioned, they also enjoyed pop and rock music, but uh, something with, you know, a little bit more intellectual depth. At one point, they really got sick of it, uh, but then I was old enough to get my own uh, little tape player, my own tape recorder uh, for my for my room. So I play tapes on, on my first uh, tape recorder. I also did my own recordings, um, not music, but I uh, I recorded my own voice. I, f I guess a lot of kids have done so. Uh, kids who grew up in the 80s and 90s who had their own tape decks. Uh, when I was still uh, pretty young, I recorded little songs I made up or children's songs that I remembered. Uh, and I recorded little stories I made up. I like to tell stories. Later on with friends when we were older, when we were teenagers, uh, we we also kept recording uh, very silly sketches, jokes. Sometimes we would just be talking nonsense for 90 minutes and uh, fill an entire tape with that. Uh, I'm afraid some of them are still lying about somewhere. And thankfully a lot of those tapes uh, have not survived uh, the years. So, apart from, of course, radio, and we are talking about the mid-80s, mid to late 80s here, um, my idea of catchy pop music was very much formed uh, by those tapes uh, my, my uncle brought. And um, to give you um, a bit of an idea what the songs, what were the songs that... Uh, I really loved as a kid of, as mentioned, four to eight years old. Uh, I just mention some that are featured on this uh, colorful, colorful old mixtape. Um, I have to start with what probably was really the first song I was completely... Uh, obsessed with or uh, the song that I could not get out of my head and I will openly uh, confess that to this day I think this is one <laughs> this is one of the very best pop tunes ever produced and the song I mean is Video Killed the Radio Star by The Buggles. really is a song I couldn't believe existed when I heard it for the first time and I still enjoy listening to it uh, it's just it's a fantastic uh, throwback to my childhood days uh, and not only that I really think Trevor Horn did, did a masterpiece with this track if you like pop music this is how pop music should be done um and I uh, I really learned the track sequence of those mixtapes by heart. I knew which song would follow. Uh, I I could more or less hum uh, the entire mixtapes out of memory without actually uh, knowing the song titles, without knowing the artists, and without uh, knowing English. So of course I couldn't 
I couldn't really sing the songs uh, as a child, but um, the melodies were were just ingrained in in my brain. Also, one of my early favorite hits was um, Kim Wilde with her, I think, biggest hit, Kids in America. Already mentioned the entrancing force of a really crazy Arthur Brown and uh, his hit Fire. I am the god of hellfire and I bring you fire. I take you to burn. Fire. I take you to learn. I'll see you all the Take No Prisoners party rock of Slate with what to this day is uh, my favorite Slate track, Come On Feel The Noise. More big hits that uh, blew me away uh, were the Electric Light Orchestra with their stomping Don't Bring Me Down. And uh, this also meant my first encounter with the heavily uh, masked or actually uh, makeup wearing Kiss. And uh, of course their most commercial hit, I Was Made For Loving You. But you have to bear in mind, back then I didn't know music videos and uh, also music videos were not shown uh, on German television or very rarely. And I was at an age where I wouldn't be seeking out music shows on television. There was um, a show called Formel 1, Formula 1, uh, which was the, one of the first shows, I think, where on German television where video clips of the then current uh, chart hits were shown. Uh, but I only got aware of, of uh, television shows like that a little bit later when I was older. Um, so I, I didn't know that KISS were KISS and I didn't know that uh, the members of KISS appeared on stage dressed up like that. For me, all I knew was uh, the music that I heard and from that I could decide what I liked and what I didn't like. And I also liked uh, quite a lot of the more obscure, uh, nowadays probably rather forgotten, uh, you know, more, as mentioned, bubblegum or, or disco tracks. And a few uh, um, that I copied from the old mixtapes to this, also old but a little less old uh, mixtape, uh, were, for instance, <coughs> a song called Danny's Disco, which, and I really had to do some research now for this episode, uh, which was performed by somebody called Jerry Lane. I have no idea whatsoever who this woman exactly 
uh, is, where she came from, uh, whether this was the only uh, thing she ever did. I'm not even sure uh, whether this is an American production or as uh, is very likely maybe even a German or Italian production because Germany, Italy were quite big when it came to disco pop in the late 70s and early 80s. No idea. For me, this is quite an obscurity, but I think this track is just, if you if you want, you know, uh, late 70s, early 80s, uh, roller disco vibes, I guess this is just perfect. Another one in this vein, and this really was music that my parents, um, that didn't do anything for my parents, or actually my parents, I think, found this um, rather annoying to, to listen to. Uh, but another track in this vein, also on this tape, is um, a song called We Are On The Race Track by Precious Wilson. And um, a track uh, that for the longest time was one of the biggest mysteries to me because I really could not find out uh, who performed this one. But now, thanks to the internet, uh, I am a little bit wiser. Susie Lane with um, a song called Harmony. And... Uh, the, the, Probably if you play this nowadays at a, a little hipster club, you get a lot of credits for this. I think it's it's a really cool, uh, slower, funky disco track. Um, and it's not surprising, it sounds so good even nowadays, because, as I've just found out, uh, this was produced and co-written by Giorgio Moroder. Uh, Susie Lane, Harmony. And then, amidst all this radio pop, uh, you know, lightweight uh, ditties, uh, occasionally there was also something else in between on my uncle's mixtapes. One of the tracks I'm referring to uh, was Lucifer by the Alan Parsons Project. And that led me onto uh, maybe a little different path or... Uh, also to, to other kinds of music. And here, uh, my parents' taste and the taste of my uncle apparently connected because having been bitten by the pop buck, as I like to call it, um, I then systematically uh, started looking for music. I took a closer look at the records of my parents, who... Uh, also had an Alan Parsons project record in their collection. But that's a story for a different day. From then on, that was uh, basically one of my favorite uh, pastimes. It's a hobby to this day. Uh, whenever we would visit relatives or parents, friends, and I had to come along, um, if possible and very politely, 
I uh, asked if I could uh, take a look at their records. And that's basically how, how it all began. My, my big love for um, discovering rock and pop music, listening to rock and pop music, and to some extent collecting rock and pop music. Uh, probably my friends, uh, my wife would say, yes, you are a record collector. I would mildly object to this. Um, I have a lot of CDs, uh, but not in a very, you know, systematic collector sense. Whatever I liked, I bought. I never placed any emphasis on uh, rarities or first pressings or, or anything like that. I'm also not really a completist, with the exception of a very few bands where I uh, actually really tried to uh, buy their, to get their entire discography, at least um, regular studio albums. And even then, I mean, pure completists would uh, seek out bootlegs and B-sides and everything. Uh, that's not really for me, uh, not even with, with my very favorite bands. Um, I'm usually happy if I if I own uh, regular studio albums or with some artists only a few albums that I'm really interested in. Uh, but then uh, those few artists over time became quite a lot of artists. So in that uh, vein, probably I am a little bit of a collector, but not you know not a professional systematic collector. You hear me talking about myself all the time. Um, whenever if you put yourself out. On the internet, um, of course, you uh, you expect that a few people will be listening to you. But uh, what's the the interesting part? I think is that uh, I can also find out something about uh, the little group of people who are watching my videos. So uh, probably the more interesting question is not how did I uh, start to um, realize that I'm a fan of pop and rock music. The more interesting question is, what are your uh, memories? What were your first, you know, really conscious experiences with maybe a pop song uh, that haunts you to this day or uh, a pop song that made you realize, hey, I want to know more about this music and uh, it's interesting to uh, look at records. Um, what were your favorite hits as as a child or what were uh, what are still maybe uh, guilty pleasure records uh, feel free to share all this in in the comment section if you like makes the thing a little bit more lively and not so much uh, centered on my own person and of course do you still have uh, some of your first mixtapes and what's on those mixtapes I'm really curious to find out and also yeah what was the the music in your household what was the music around you that you grew up with um some pop and rock fans uh tell stories of older siblings who influenced their taste or parents who influenced their taste others uh talk of exactly the opposite uh, because yeah my parents only listened to classical music and they hated rock music or uh, in Germany, my parents listened to terrible Schlager music, and then I discovered hard rock, and <laughs> it was an epiphany. Um, and some maybe will say that music never was a big thing in their family, uh, and all of a sudden they were struck by lightning when, I don't know, they went to a bar and heard Dire Straits, Sultans of Swings for the first time. A lot of questions. Uh, tell me your stories, share with others, and uh, stay tuned. I probably will take a little break from, from the tape memories, um, and find out what else I've got in my boxes and uh, what else there is that uh, may be really interesting to talk about. And as you know, I have this rather uh, random schedule, so the next video uh very certainly will be uh, something completely different probably another al another album review 
or maybe another list of, I don't know, Murdoch's 20 favorite songs about uh, colored socks. Coming to think of it, that would be an interesting thing. See you again, maybe, hopefully. Uh, hope you enjoyed this. Bye-bye.